Well, good morning again. Good morning. Uh, we're going to continue in our uh, sermon series, Insight. Today is uh, No More Keeping Score. Will you pray with me, please? Father God, we just uh, ask you this morning to make our hearts right before you and each other. Please do a work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, most of you know that go here heard that I grew up in Rising Sun, Indiana, which was close to Cincinnati. I grew up in the 70s. Of course, and you've all heard before, loving the Cincinnati Reds, okay? And you've all heard before stories of me and my grandpa watching the Cincinnati Reds on television and getting real serious about it. But one part I've never told you about. We got so serious about it that me and my grandpa, my papa, we used scorecards. And we had scorecards during the game, and what we do, we would write down what a player did and what a player didn't do. And then sometimes I got to go to Riverfront Stadium and really be at the ballpark. Owen Dougal took me there. We drove in a big Lincoln Town car, okay? I, will, I won't tell you who drove if we keep that a secret. But anyway, we would go to the Reds game, and we would have a scorecard, and me and Owen would get serious about keeping track of what a player did and what a player didn't. I'm not here this morning to talk about the Cincinnati Reds, what a player did, well I heard that, what a player did and what a player didn't, and I'm not here to talk about the Cardinals or the Cubs, amen, but I'm here, spiritually speaking, to talk about us. Do we keep score? What people wrong us we feel, or hurt us we feel, or take advantage of us we feel, in our hearts, do we have a bit of a scorecard. And if we do, what's going to happen is bitterness is going to be born. Amen? Amen? And rage is going to be born. And wow, unforgiveness is going to be born. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 says this. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31, it says get rid of some. Does it say that? Okay. It's get rid of some and you can keep a little. No, it doesn't say that. It says you can keep a part of the scorecard, right? No, it doesn't say that. It says get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. It's got to go. It's got to go. No more keeping score. The unhealthy scorecard's got to go. Why has it got to go? Because God says it's got to go. To be the men and women that God wants us to be, it is a got to go. Got to go. Get rid of it. And be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Follow God's example. Some translations say, be imitators of God. Follow God's example. You know what? When I was a kid, growing up, and I played baseball in Little League, every time I went up to bat, I imitated Pete Rose. I imitated Pete Rose. I tried to be like Charlie Hustle. I tried to be like Pete. Growing up, when I played basketball, I tried to imitate Larry Bird. I wanted to be just like Larry Bird. And then, when we were down in my grandma's basement, and we were wrestling, we call it wrestling, I pretended I was Ric Flair. Woo! <laughs> now, that's kid stuff. Pretending I'm Pete Rose. Pretending I'm Larry Bird. Pretending I'm Ric Flair. Woo! But when it comes to being imitators of God, we got to get serious. We got to get serious. If we want to be the church that the Lord would have us to be, if we want to be the individuals that the Lord would have us to be, we have to get serious. Be imitators of God. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the ways of love, just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Valentine's Day. Love is in the air. Cupid, draw back your bow. <laughs> hey, for the Christian, for the Christian, you like that, didn't you? For the Christian, every day should be a day of love. Amen? Amen. But it can't be if we're walking 
around <laughs> keeping score. If we're walking around keeping score. So I want you to take a moment and I want you to let God check you out. I want you to let God let you know if your heart is really in the place it needs to be. If you're really headed in the right direction. And maybe He'll let you know this morning that you're not. That you got it backwards. Let me tell you a funny story about backwards that happened to me Friday. <laughs> Alright. It's Friday. It's time for me to get my picture taken. So I'm getting all sported up. I actually wore this suit, okay? And I was upstairs in the parsonage, and I was getting dressed, and Chad came over, and I had my suit all on, and I thought I was looking good. I thought I was looking dapper. I thought I was ready. Well, Chad comes up, and he comes in the room, and he says, Hey, Sammy, and I say, Hey, Chad, and he got a funny look on his face. Bless his heart, he hated to do it, but he had to do it. He looked at me, and he said, Sammy, you got your pants on backwards. <laughs> And I said, what? I had my pants on. <laughs> See, when I've lost weight, I don't button them anymore. I just pull them off. And I was up there getting ready to look dapper and dangerous for my picture, and I put my pants on back. And I'm going to tell you the truth. If Chad hadn't said anything, there I'd be in the directory with my pants on back. Good grief of mine. Yeah. Now listen. That's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. And I'm glad he told me. But when it comes to getting it wrong about the things of God, when it comes to getting wrong, when it comes to forgiveness, that is not a laughing matter. And I know you've heard preachers say it again and again. Unforgiveness, it'll, 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 it'll put bitterness in your heart. And that's true. And it'll put slander in your heart. And that's true, but listen to me. It's deeper than that. Unforgiveness is a salvation issue. Unforgiveness is a salvation issue. Look with me in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That is awesome news, isn't it? That we can be forgiven for all our sin. Woo, that's awesome. But, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Your Father will not forgive your sins. That is a salvation ish issue. We must really forgive each other. Well, my girls were about seven and nine. They were upstairs in the playroom. And that's about the time they both started karate, okay? So they're up in the playroom, and they're in a fight over Barbie dolls, all right? And they're up there, hi y'all, just going at it. So I run up the stairs to get it stopped, and I break it up, and little Shelby Grace is crying. And she looks at Butter, and she says, Butter, I am so sorry. And bless her heart, it was sincere. And Butter looks at Shelby, and she says, Shelby Grace, I'm sorry on the outside, but on the inside, I'm still mad as a hornet. <laughs> yeah. But let's be honest. How many of us? And how many of us in the church? Oh, on the outside, I forgive you. Everything is okay. But on the inside, we are mad as hornets. Wow. That's a serious issue. I've got to read this again. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, I'm not telling you that if you are in an abusive situation, mentally, verbally, or sexually, that forgiveness means to stay in that situation because it doesn't. It means to get out of the situation. It means to be safe. But in your heart, you have forgiven them. You have. How do you do it? The power of God. 
the power of God, the grace of God. You know, I got a friend of mine. I've known him since he was a little fella. Now he's a big fella. And he was in a relationship and it didn't work out. And there was two kids involved. And there was visitation rights. And his little girl came home from a visit. And she had a bite mark on her arm all the way to the bone. And her little backside was completely beaten and bruised. It had been done with a wooden spoon. And you can imagine his emotion at first. You can imagine his anger. You, you, you can imagine his desire to get revenge. But he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he sought God. And you know what? He has truly forgiven them on the inside out. How do you do that? The power of God. Amen. The power of God. Listen, we, we understand it. We do. We know how much God has forgiven us. We know what we've done. We know what we're capable of. Oh my goodness, we should be the most forgiving people on the planet. <coughs> but you know what? If we're not careful, we, we fall into this parable in Matthew 18, starting with the 21st verse. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked. And I bet he came to Jesus kind of excited with a skip in his step, like he was doing it right, like he had the right answer. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Up to seven times, see, because he thought he was really being forgiving. And he was really being gracious. Because the rabbis in those days, they taught three times. You only had to forgive three times. Strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. Going to store that scorecard forever. So he says seven times. He thinks he's doing great. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times 7 times, which is 490 times. So, do we forget 490 times? No, that's not what Christ meant. I love what the NIV note says. But Jesus answered, 70 times 7 times, meaning that we shouldn't even keep track of how many times we forgive someone. Jesus answered, I tell you, not 7 times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven it's like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. That was $12 million. That's a lot of change back then. That's a lot of change today. $12 million. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. As this servant fell on his knees before him, be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. And canceled the debt and let him go. And when I was studying for this sermon and I read that, canceled the debt and let him go. I thought, wow, isn't it awesome that Jesus had canceled the debt for us? And let us go, huh? Do you really understand? I don't mean to be a downer this morning. But do you really understand how sinful we are and can be? You know, I, I, I looked at Exodus chapter 20. The, the, uh, the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20 verse 3. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an image. Verse 7, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Verse 12, honor your father and mother. Verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Verse 16, you shall not give false testimony. Verse 17, you shall not covet. And then in the New Testament it says, Matthew 4.10, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. 
Luke 16, 13, no one can serve two masters. Matthew 5, 33, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. Mark 2, 27 and 28, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Matthew 10, 37, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 5, 22, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Matthew 5, 28, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew 5, 40, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Matthew 12, 36, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Luke 12, 15, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Woo! <laughs> Aren't you glad because of Jesus Christ our debt has been canceled? I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but I got a big debt. Thank you, Jesus. He took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. And I bet you after that, that guy was so fired up and so stoked up to get out of there and find somebody to just lavish forgiveness on, right? For the forgiveness that he'd been given? Man, he was ready to forgive, right? Wrong. But when that servant went out, he found one. Well, if he found one, he had to be looking. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. That was $17. 17, that was it. He just didn't forgive 12 million. $17. <coughs> he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. Sound familiar? But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. Okay, this is the verse I want you to get. This is the one. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive <laughs> unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is serious. This is a salvation issue. Oh God, give us a heart to really forgive inside and out. Give us a heart to get rid of the scorecard. You know, my first week in ministry, we had a, we had a fellow that was just an awesome youth coach. But every two months or so, he would come in my office. And he had a notebook, which he called his journal. And he would sit down and he would need to talk to me. And in that notebook, he had written down everybody that he felt like had wronged him. And he would tell me all about it, how they wronged him and took advantage of him and didn't treat him right every couple of months. Well, one day he came in and I said, I listened, you know, and I said, hey, you know what, I just think you need to read, probably every day, 1 Corinthians 13.5. And it says that love keeps no records of wrong. Christ-like love keeps no records of wrong. Well, he left the church, and I'm sure he had me do the list. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, you can't, you can't forgive like this with human power. It takes the divine. It takes the divine. 
but we got to desire it. We got to want it. To be the witness that Christ wants us to be, we got to want it and we got to have it. But please get this. It is a salvation issue. Got it? You know, I'm just going to simply end this sermon today with this shirt inside out. That's it. Inside out. And I encourage you to go home, find a shirt, turn it inside out, hang it somewhere in your closet, where you see it every day when you start your day. And you can be reminded that I am really to forgive inside out. Inside out. This is tough this morning. Because uh, this is tough. But if you are here this morning, and you got an unhealthy scorecard in your heart, it's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. You know, in the greatest example, remember, remember what Jesus said? Forgive them, will they not know what they do? So if you're here this morning, and you have been carrying unforgiveness in your heart, I invite you, if you want to, and we have the invitation to come and bow and, and, and pray. If you need to talk to me, Elders will come up if you come up. If you need to do it that way, and the Lord is telling you you need to do it that way, then you need to do it that way. If you can make it right with God where, where you're sitting, that's cool too. But make it right. Make it right. Not just because of the bitterness and the rage, but it is a salvation issue on the authority of the Word of God. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, then I invite you to come. If you're here this morning and there are other areas that you're not in step with Christ and you need to come, come. If you're here this morning and you want to make Weber Street your church home, then, then come. But listen, let all of us be obedient to God this morning. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me as I pray? Father God, uh, you know, I, I come to you this morning as your child, and by a lot of grace, uh, a preacher, a pastor, and I have sure dealt with unforgiveness, and I have sure dealt with having a scorecard in my heart, but I've also seen your power, and I've seen you work. And I've seen through you by grace that I've been able to pray for those folks by name and really wish the best. And it's nothing that's good about Sam. It's because I have a good God. And God, I just ask you to move in your goodness and your might and your grace in folks' heart so they can really and truly get rid of the scorecard. And we can love people and care about people inside out for real. For real, God, give people today, God, the strength and courage to be obedient to whatever you're telling them to do. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>